Uh, well, if you were here with us last week, we opened up, uh, I opened up with uh, an analogy that we're going to continue on for the next few weeks. And so if you were not here last week, I'm going to give you a very br brief recap because otherwise uh, you may miss some of the symbolism. But we're going to be dealing with and drawing on that imagery of ascending Mount Zion. And so we learned last week from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, that in Christ, because he has uh, stood in our place, he has drawn us to himself, he has united us to himself, in him, we have come to Mount Zion. We have come to the city of the living God. We have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. If you are in Christ, you belong and you dwell on his mountain now. And so the Christian life, the Christian walk is one of a climb. Sanctification is a process of growing closer and closer to the Lord, growing more and more into the image of Christ, getting closer and closer to the day when we will see him face to face. It may be difficult. It may be rocky. It may be hard. It may sometimes feel stagnant, but it is all, when we look back, it is always upward. And it is always on his mountain because he has placed you there and no one can pull you off and you can't fall so far as to not continue on that, that journey. So the mountain imagery is going to be important for us uh, this week and the next few weeks. And so last week we emphasized the climbing aspect, um, alluding to rest making some mention of some of us are so headstrong, we're so concerned with making our way up the path with our own personal goals that we stop and fail to rest and gaze in the beauty of God's creation, to rest and take in his wonderful work on our behalf. And so this morning, uh, we're going to be emphasizing more of the rest. But I want you to get this week and going forward, uh, and for the rest of our lives. It is not an either or, it's a both and. We climb, we walk out our salvation with fear and trembling, and we rest as we walk. Because what was required for us to be on that mountain, what is required for us to grow in sanctification, has been satisfied in Christ. So we can rest in his finished work. We can walk, we can climb, and at times we get to run. We should run because, as Pastor Brett said a moment ago, often we feel fettered by our own failures. Fetters like a chain, uh, handcuffs. But Christ has removed those, and he has freed us so that we can follow him. And so my purpose in this sermon is to help us be satisfied and rest as we climb. To help us be satisfied and rest as we climb. And so often, before we can get to the remedy, we have to diagnose the problem. And uh, this is a collective support meeting, and we have a common human problem with discontentment and restlessness. There is no one in this room who is immune to it. And if we're honest with ourselves, we realize that our discontentment, our restlessness, our looking around at other things to find comfort and fulfillment and meaning leads to a lack of satisfaction. Because we can't find them in other things. The pleasures of this world will never give you satisfaction. If the Rolling Stones couldn't find it, no one can. <laughs> if there was satisfaction to be found in this world, 80-year-old Mick Jagger and 80-year-old Keith Richards have been trying their whole lives, they would have found it by now. But we won't either. But the problem is, we continue to fill our hearts and our bellies with things that leave us less satisfied. We keep trying over and over and over again. How many of us have opened that, that a bag of chips and like, I can just have a couple and I'll be satisfied? This is exactly what I need and I'm going to be good after this. How many of us have made it to the end of that bag of chips and like, what did I just do? or the bag of M&Ms, or fill in the blank here. But that's what happens when we fill our bellies with something that cannot satisfy. Salt and sugar are not meant to satisfy us long term. The things of this world are not meant to satisfy us long term. There is no one in this room who has scrolled Facebook or YouTube for two hours and said, that was a great use of my time. 
I am so glad I just did that. I'm more edified. I feel closer to Christ. And I felt like I just had, I had a productive two hours. Um, those of you who know what I'm talking about are laughing. Those of you who are not laughing are lying to yourselves. <laughs> but we all do it. And the lies of this world, the idols of this world, is like one more chip, one more M&M, one more video, and I'll feel satisfied. I'll find what I am longing for. That's what happens when we try to fill our hearts with what cannot satisfy. Here's what Augustine said about that. Because you have made us for yourself, God has designed us, knit us together so perfectly that only he will satisfy us. And our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. So, brothers and sisters, the question I ask myself often, and you can leave that up there for a moment. I want that to sink in. The question I ask myself often when I'm restless, which is often, is what am I looking for uh, satisfaction in? What am I looking for that cannot satisfy? How often do I find my satisfaction in the Lord, and how often do I find my satisfaction in other things? How long am I trying to fill my restless heart with things that, that just can't? And how often does my restless heart find true rest when I can reflect and rest and meditate and just dwell in the presence of my God. So, our text this morning is going to encourage us to that. Give us reason for that. Uh, it's going to declare it. It's going to proclaim it to us. And so, um, I'm excited to explain our text, uh, but we are going to have to do a, a bit of explanation, a bit of building the foundation, so then we can apply uh, and we're going to tease out some things, but that will give full impact to the application. So we're in Psalm 65. You can open your Bibles to Psalm 65. I know you guys went through this on Wednesday night. I think Sam taught on it. Um, uh, but we're going to flesh out uh, just one verse here. However, to give context, I want to be begin re uh, reading at the beginning of the psalm. And just so you know, the opening lines... Uh, those are not ancient headings. This is actually the uh, first verse in the, in the Hebrew Bible. The uh, superscriptions are things we should read. Uh, that is direction in worship for the psalm. Psalm 65 to the choir master. A psalm of David, a song. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless the preaching and hearing of your word this morning. Would you remove any hindrances and distractions that so often plague us? Charles Spurgeon calls those the mosquitoes of the mind that buzz in our ear and draw us to everything we have to do this week, everything that we failed at last week, all those broken relationships that Pastor Brett mentioned, the failing bodies, the failed expectations, all the other things that can so easily distract us. Lord, would you silence those things? Would your spirit perk up our ears, stir up our hearts to be drawn by your word, that we would find comfort in it, we would find healing, we would find encouragement, we would find rest, that we would see our Savior clearly, see his work on our behalf. See that his work is finished. So we can finish our own striving. And we can run unfettered in his finished work. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. So whenever looking at a verse in scripture, it is important to understand the context. Uh, it's verse four is helpful in and of itself. But verse four 
is more helpful and uh, supremely helpful because of what comes before it, because of what sets it up. So I want you to see the context and the progression, the setup here. Uh, first and foremost, this is a song. David is instructing Israel to praise the Lord for who he is and what he's done. This is something that is so good, it is worth singing. And I hope that's evident and I hope that jumps off the text. He begins like he often begins. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion. Last week, we dealt a lot with the symbolism of Zion. And so if you weren't here, I encourage you to go back. I'm not going to go through all that. But Zion had a geographic significance. It was the mountain where the city of David, the temple was on. It was the dividing line between the northern and southern kingdom. It was where all of the people of Israel would come together to worship God. It had a spiritual significance because that's where God's temple was, where he dwelled, where his people came to worship. And it had a messianic significance. There was a lot of expectation that a son would come from the line of David and he would rule in Zion forever. And all of these promises would come to Zion. It would be a house of God. It would be a, a, a temple where worship would, would happen and his people would come to him from every nation. And Zion is that imagery that was rich in the lives of Israel. It had a present reality and a future hope. And we also looked at the New Testament. When you see Zion in the New Testament, it is no longer a future hope. It is a present reality. That if you are in Christ, you are citizens of Zion now. And so all of that is baked into in Zion, the place where God dwells. We, we saw that earlier in Psalm 132. That all of the promises that were given to David that were to be fulfilled in Zion are found in Christ. I hope you saw that when we read through Psalm 132, all of the imagery, I encourage you to go back. But Zion sums up the people of God, God himself, the worship of God, his presence, his dwelling in eternal security. But in David's day, it was, it was in a place. He had to go to the temple and so he sees the temple as he should, the place and the presence and the representation of God among his people. So this is what David is saying. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. No other gods should have our efforts. Verse 2. O you who hear prayer, we know God hears us. To you shall all flesh come. That's important. Right now, it's only Israel who can go into the temple. Even if you're a, a, a Gentile who has an interest, you must stay in the outer courts. But even David sees a day when all flesh shall come. This is throughout the psalm. Verse 5. By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth. Verse 8 as well. So that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe of your signs. David didn't live in a day when the good news that a God is found in Israel and he saves sins was going to the end of the earth. But he looked forward to a day and a son of David would bring that good news to the end of the earth. And so now in verse 3, why do we praise? Why does all flesh come? Because here is what's at the heart of all of this. Verse 3, when iniquities prevail against me, when my sins are ever before me, they are so heavy I cannot bear them. I have struggled against my sin and failed time and time again. You atone for our transgressions. That is at the heart of this psalm. Why are people coming to Zion? Why is Zion so important? Because that is where the atonement, the covering of blood, the price paid for sin is poured out. That is where forgiveness happens. That is where man is reconciled back to God. What was separated in the fall has now been reunited through the atonement. That Israel had to do year after year after year because the blood of lambs could not satisfy the sin of an entire nation. But there would be a lamb that would come. A spotless lamb. And when his blood was shed, perfect and blameless, he could atone for an entire nation. A new people, 
a new nation, the people of Zion. And so, when iniquities prevail, there is atonement for sin. This is why David is praising God. David is praising God in a time when there was one day of atonement once a year. We get to praise God knowing that there was one day of atonement on the cross and it is finished forever. And so we praise God for his greatness and we praise God for his mercy. And this is the message to the end of the earth. This is the hope of the nations. And this is the foundation for verse 4. Everybody with me? Verse 4. Blessed is the one. Blessed is the one. Now, here is the posture of the one who comes near. Here is the posture of the one who comes to Zion. Here is the promise for all those who would come in the future. Blessed is the one who you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house and the holiness of your temple. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the blessed ones. And I want to do a little bit of clarification here. If you've been in general Christian circles for a while, um, it's common to hear the idea of being blessed. Uh, you see people with the bedazzled t-shirts and, it, um, and it, it makes them feel like I'm having a really good day because I have my, my blessed shirt on. Uh, or you've heard this, how are you doing? I am blessed, and I'm sure he's finishing the sentence, I am blessed and highly favored. What do people mean when they say that? Usually what people mean when they say that is my circumstances are going exactly how I think they should. Everything is just how I intended it to be. God has been good to me in my job and, 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 my, and my family and all of these things. But here's the problem with that definition of being blessed. Is what happens when it doesn't? What happens when you get fired? What happens when your home life is miserable? What happens when all of your plans don't work out? Are you still blessed? Because if your blessing is circumstantial, it will always be subject to change. But here's the thing. Our blessing is not circumstantial. It's positional. Here's what I mean by that. Our being blessed, the blessed ones are not blessed because things are going well in their life. They are blessed because their position is in a right standing with God. Their position is ones whose sins have been atoned for. Their position is ones who've been chosen and drawn near. Their position is ones who dwell with the true and living God. Being blessed is not a life according to our standards. But it is a life according to our standing with God. To be blessed is not a life according to our standards. It is a life according to our standing with God. Psalm 144 said this, Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. That is the biblical standard of being blessed. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. Because you can be broke and be blessed. You can be sick and be blessed. You can have everything going wrong in your life and still have all things in Christ Jesus for all eternity. Amen. That is true blessing. So I want to expand on the characteristics of these blessed ones. What does the psalm have to teach us about what it means to be blessed? And as we go through, I want you to see all of the fulfillment in the New Testament. We're going to look at a, quite a few parallel passages here, but this will be important. Number one, you have, should have four uh, slots there in your outline. Number one, blessed is the one who you chose. This is important. Like he says to Israel, like he says to the church, our God is not a haphazard God. Our God is not a, a helpless, passive God who is waiting for a people to think he's better than the other options that are out there. Our God is an intentional, loving, active God who chooses a people for himself. This is the beauty of election and adoption. He chooses us to bless us in Christ. This is exactly what Paul says in Ephesians 1. 
first of many parallel passages. Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6. Paul says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. First and foremost, he blesses God. Why does he bless God? Because we have seen his blessing in Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So if you're looking for a blessing in your life and your circumstances, where are those blessings to be found? True blessings, true riches, as Christ told us, it's in the heavenly places where neither rust nor moth destroy. That is where real blessing is because that kingdom is unshakable as we saw last week. This kingdom is, is constantly changing. The kingdom we build for ourselves is constantly changing. How far back does that blessing go? When you finally got your stuff together and dragged yourself to God, Verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. We can enjoy the holiness of God's house because he has called us and transformed us into new creatures who are now holy. Because this has been his plan all along. That's how much he loves you. He wasn't waiting for you to get your stuff together because he'd been waiting a long time. That we should be holy and blameless before him. Now into verse 5. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace we praise him for the same thing David did with which he has blessed us in the beloved. True blessing is being, is being in Christ. That is what it means to be blessed. I am united to the son of the living God. His blood covers me. His righteousness is mine. My sins were given to him. That is blessing. That is what it means to be blessed. To be chosen. To be adopted. To be brought in. And it's not just chosen. Let's go back to Psalm 65. Number two. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near. Because again, God knows we cannot drag our wretched, sinful, dead corpses to God. There are no zombie movies in real life. No dead man has ever dragged himself to life. No dead man has ever revived himself except the one who made new life possible. And that ain't you. He chose and drew near. Here's what Jesus says in John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. I want you to think of the picture here. Jesus describes himself in many parables as a groomsman, a master, a king who goes away. This king has a great kingdom. This king has a kingdom with, with, with high walls that is secure and protected. And this king looks out amongst the peasants and says, you are mine, you are mine, you are mine. But those dirty peasants, that's us, are too scared and too unworthy to, to bring ourselves before the king. So what does the king do? He sends out his soldiers. He sends out his messengers and he ushers us in. He says, no, you are mine, I'm gonna clean you up. I'm going to bring you into my kingdom and I'm going to put you into my dwelling place and one day I'm coming back and I will inherit my kingdom. But right now you are secure. We'll get more on, on Jesus coming back in a moment. Not only does he choose and he draws us to him, but he promises I'm coming back. And on that day, I will raise you up again. But until that day, I've chosen you. I've drawn you. I've brought you into my house. 
Here's the third, the, the third characteristic. Dwelling. You're chosen, you're drawn, and you dwell. So I want you to look at the, the, the terminology here. Uh, courts, house, temple. These all have a bit of variance, but they're, they're, they're synonyms. These are all terms that were associated with the temple. The temple is the house of God. It has inner courts, outer courts. It is the, the, the Holy of Holies. Um, but as we know, in the book of Hebrews, the temple is only a pattern in shadow of heavenly things. It's an earthly copy of heavenly things. But here's the picture. This is the king's house. God's palatial mansion has these, these courts where you can be invited in and you come freely to worship. You come to dwell in the presence of the king. And we learned from last week that the reality with the believer today, everyone who is united to Christ, is you are in that city now. You are in that kingdom now. You dwell in the courts of the living God. I, I want to flesh this out a little bit. I want to flesh out some of these ideas. And to, so to substantiate this, I want to go back to the book of Hebrews. So let's turn in your Bible to Hebrews. If you don't know where Hebrews is, go toward the end of your Bible. If you find Revelation, a couple small books and go to the left, you'll, you'll get there. Hebrews chapter 3. Remember our, our terms here. Uh, court, house, temple. We're specifically going to look at house and temple. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. The writer of Hebrews is giving the same argument here. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him. Just, now here's where the analogy is being drawn out. Just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has counted worthy, Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. As much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. He's the one who's building, but there is a house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. He's the one who owns the house. What is the house, you may ask? And we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confession and are boasting in our hope. Think about that for a moment. The title of this sermon is Satisfied in the House of the Lord. If you are in Christ, you are the house of the Lord. What David had to go to the temple for now is given to us. Uh, more on that in a moment. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of heavenly things, that is the temple on earth, to be purified with these rites, blood spilled for forgiveness of sins. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Now here's the, here's the key for those who are looking for a temple on earth. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. How is it that we can be called the house of God? How is it that we can approach the holy of holies, the temple itself, because Jesus Christ has gone before us? Because his is the blood of the final sacrifice. Because he stands on our behalf. Christ came to dwell with us on earth that we might dwell with him in heaven. And as we said last week, you're standing with Christ, you're positioned with Christ. If you are in Christ, is no greater in heaven than it is now. You are fully in Christ. You will never be more secure in Christ than you are now because his work is finished on our behalf. This is exactly what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, 4 through 6. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And notice, these are not future tense verbs. They're past tense. By grace you have been saved, completed. 
and raised up, completed with him and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, if you're in Christ, you have been saved, you have been raised up, and you have been seated already in Christ. That is your identity. That is your position. That is what it means that we have become the house of the Lord. His work. He has chosen us. He has drawn us near. He has made us his temple right now. Here's what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I told you there'll be a few of these, but this is important for our application. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. What agreement has as the temple of God with idols? That'll be important for our application. Keep that one in the back of your head. For we are the temple of the living God. He's talking about the church here. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. Idols he's talking about here. And touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God, the Lord Almighty, the Lord God Almighty. We are the house of the living God right now. We are the temple of the living God right now. We are sons and daughters of the king right now. That is what it means to be adopted. We are justified by his blood. We are chosen before the foundation of the world. We are adopted into his family. We are secure as his house and his temple. And we are called to be separate from the world. And ours is a greater reality than David's because David had to travel to the temple, even if his house was right down the hill. He needed to go to the temple because God dwelt there. We come together and worship because God dwells with us right now. Amen. It is no longer the place that is holy. It is the people. It's exactly what Jesus told the Samaritan woman in John 4. This is important. John 4. She's asking about where to worship in the previous verses. And Jesus says to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming, and neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship. You worship what you do not know. As a Samaritan, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. It came first to the Jews, but then also to the Gentiles. Now here's the key. The hour is coming and is now here, right now, and until Christ returns, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Here's what Jesus is saying. There was a time, for a long time, you had to go to a mountain, and all of Israel had to go to a mountain. But now the mountain has come to you. Zion has taken on flesh. It is before your eyes that this is fulfilled in God and his people, and you can worship in spirit and truth wherever you are. So the woman is starting to pick up what he's laying down in verse 25. She says, she says, I know that the Messiah is coming. He who is called the Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. All the expectation for Israel and Zion is standing right in front of her. And he is calling her to worship him in spirit and truth. We looked at 1 Peter chapter 2 last week. I want to look at a different aspect of it again. I'm laying a, I want to lay a multi-level foundation here so when we get to the application, uh, we see it rightly. 1 Peter chapter 2, 4 and 5. Peter says this. As you come to him, Christ is a living stone. He is the cornerstone. He's the one rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves are living stones being built up as a spiritual house, what's the purpose? To be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I could go on and on and on. You get the point. What David looked forward to in Psalm 65, what David had to travel to the Temple Mount to get, we have right now. Living stones being built up, and when we come to worship, the living stones assemble and we praise God in unison because that is how he's designed us. That is how he has called us. And we become his house. If you follow the, uh, you know, what happens in, in, uh, in the UK, 
they have royal houses throughout history, you know, Wessex and Windsor and all of these. And each of those houses has a lord, and they are known by their lord. This is the same kind of imagery. We are a spiritual house, and we bear the name of our lord. But it's not some cheap prince or king. It is the king of kings. Our lord has brought us into his house and given us his identity and shared his land and his riches with us. And so I want to encourage you that we don't enter into the house of the Lord once a week. We are the house of the Lord all week. And when we come together as a family reunion, it is one of great celebration because we're reminding each other, God has made his dwelling place with us. God has made us his house. God has made us his family. And so now the first three of these four characteristics leads us to the fourth. The blessed ones are satisfied. You say theological sentence here because it's important. Our soteriology declares our satisfaction. What we believe about salvation declares whether we'll be satisfied or not. Let me, let me flesh this out a little bit. If you have been chosen in Christ, nothing that you have done, good or evil, nothing that you contributed on your own, if he has drawn you, he has brought you in to dwell with him into his house, he has covered you with his atonement, he has become your high priest so that you can pray to him, he was raised so that you would be raised to new life. He ascended on high so that you could ascend with him. He satisfies the law's demands, and he satisfied our debt completely. In the gospel, in our salvation, we have seen the goodness of the courts of the Lord. We have seen the holiness of his temple. And we can only be led to one conclusion, that Christ is our satisfaction. Because the gospel tells us that everything that David had hoped for, everything that David got a glimpse of in the temple of the living God was satisfied in Christ Jesus. And so we must then ask ourselves, is Christ enough? Are you satisfied in Christ? Now here's, here we land, here's where we land and spend some time in application because we need it. I want to let that marinate for a moment. Think about everything we just talked about. Think about your identity, brother and sister in Christ. Is Christ enough? Are you satisfied in him? So first I want to begin with some basic definitions. Do we know what it means to be satisfied? So the basic dictionary definition of satisfaction or to be satisfied is to have your, your needs, your desires, or your expectations met. To have contentment. I have exactly what I need. That's the dictionary definition. The Hebrew definition goes a little bit deeper and a step further. The Hebrew definition is basically to be fully satiated. But not just that I'm completely full. I am so full, I could not take one more bite. I am so stuffed, I couldn't eat half of a Lay's potato chip. I am so full, I am so satisfied, I can't even take it. This is what David is saying in the 23rd Psalm. He's saying, you have so filled me and so overwhelmed me with your steadfast love that I am full and it is overflowing out of me. You're familiar with these words in the, in the 23rd Psalm, but think about this together. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. That's the type of satisfaction that David is talking about. And out of that overflowing, he knows, surely, by all means, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is what it means to be satisfied in Christ. That is the satisfaction that David, the man after God's own heart, has. And then I have to ask you, do you have that kind of satisfaction? I got to be honest. I wish I did. Maybe I get glimpses of it. And I have been praying for that. I was praying for that this morning. I'm reading these texts myself, and I'm so convicted. I'm convicted by texts like uh, Psalm 63, 5. 
I spent a lot of time in the Psalms over the summer. Psalm 63, 5. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. Do I look at Christ like I look at the, the uh, ribeye or the, or the um, brisket or the cookies? Usually not. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of my night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. How often are we able to just sit and meditate and praise him that his right hand upholds us? Man, I'm jealous of that. Man, I wish I had more of that. Because if I'm being honest, spending a lot of times in the Psalms it's over the summer and a lot of times in my own thoughts, I was convicted by how busy and hurry and impatient I am. How I often don't slow down. I fail to rest and reflect as I climb. That I struggle being satisfied in the Lord. And just being honest, my prayers, my Bible reading, my thoughts are often rushed and scattered. I am drawn in so many different directions. It's hard to keep my thoughts straight sometimes. Any, am I the only one? Anyone else? And it's mostly good things. It's not necessarily sinful things. But how often are the cheap imitations, the splendor of temporary pleasures, tasks, and accomplishments a distraction for me or a place I'm looking for satisfaction instead of the sweet honey of the presence of the Lord? That's a sobering thought. Can I just sit and find my satisfaction in the Lord? Can I be satisfied as I am after a good meal? And then I had to think about it. Going back to the problem that we set up at the beginning. We have a discontentment problem. We have so many choices. We have so many options. We have so many bright and shiny things that are calling our attention. There may not be toy stores anymore. If you're old enough to remember toy stores, you ever seen a little kid go into a toy store? It's like, I want that, and I want that, and I want that. How satisfied is the little kid in a toy store? That is the least satisfied little kid you will ever see because he wants everything all at once. And we're adults, and how often do we do the same thing? How often are we looking to the next shiny thing, toys that will never satisfy us? I want to go this way. I want to go this way. Maybe that will give me fulfillment. Maybe that will give me comfort. But they can't. They won't. Just like the toy that your kid loves for about five seconds until he starts playing with the box. How many times do we do that within our own hearts? And here's the the danger. When we begin to take temporary things and make them ultimate things, we create idols. That's what Paul said earlier. What fellowship is the temple of the living God with idols? Here's why idols are dangerous. Because they promise satisfaction apart from the house of a living God. They promise fulfillment outside of the presence of God. That's why these things are are dangerous. Because they compete. Not just they compete, they draw us away from the God who has drawn us to himself. Greed and lust and pride and coveting and fear and comfort all promise lies of temporary fulfillment, but they make us lose sight of eternal truth and satisfaction. That is what God is jealous for us, because we are his house. We are his temple. And so over the next couple weeks, I want to talk about why we fail to be satisfied sometimes. And usually, it's one of two things. We are looking too far ahead. What we must do all the things that, that, that come and we worry about our plans for tomorrow. That'll be next week. Or we look too much behind. All the things we didn't get done. All the things that, that, that we failed at. That we have or have not done well. But we are too focused on what will happen tomorrow, which is up to the Lord. Or what happened yesterday, which is outside of our control. It robs us of being satisfied today. Here's another text that convicted me. Psalm 90, verse 14. Satisfy us 
in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. I don't know about you, but I need that reminder every morning. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Here's just a little, this, this is a freebie, it's not even in the notes. Um, do you want better satisfaction with the Lord throughout the day? Start with him in the morning. I know the time when I get up earlier, even when I don't want to, and I have quiet with him, and I'm able to reflect and pray and meditate on his word, my day is just different. I can't explain it. I've, I've spent time with the Lord. How about those days when you wake up late and, you, and, and then you forget and you're scrambling around and you barely have time to uh, brush your teeth and you don't even think about the Lord until um, maybe you decide to pray before lunch? That's a very different kind of day. David, again and again in the Psalms, this is actually a prayer of Moses, but reminds us to be satisfied. When we begin with our satisfaction in the morning, then we are glad throughout all of our days. And so that's why I wanted to lay the foundation we did. Remember, Christ, he chose me, he drew me, and he called me to dwell with him. And so, saints, we can be satisfied as we climb. We are making our way up Zion, and we are fully at home in his house. So what can we do? What are the remedies in our last couple moments here? What actions can I offer? What is the... Cure all solution for this. There is no cure all. You are sinners. We're going to battle with this for the rest of our lives. But I'm going to give you two simple things. You need to look in two directions. I want to clarify that. Number one, glance at yourself often. Remember the words here. Glance at yourself. Look inward. Take stock. Quick glances now. Search your heart. Where are you looking for comfort? Where are you looking for satisfaction? How many things you think will satisfy you are idols? What is competing with your affections for Christ? And put it away. For most of us in this room, it would just be put it, taking our phone and putting it on the other side of the house. Right? That would clear up a lot of our satisfaction problems. So number one, take a look at yourself. Glance at yourself. Take stock. Identify where your heart idols are. But number two, and more importantly, gaze at Christ. Stare at him. Remember all of these gospel promises that we unfolded earlier. Samuel Rutherford is famous for saying, for every one look at yourself you take, take ten looks at the cross. Yes, look at yourself. Examine yourself. Just like when we come to the table. Examine yourself. Make sure, am I, I, am, am I right with God? And then gaze at Christ. Stare at him. Behold him. And keep your eyes fixed on him. Consider Christ Jesus, founder and perfecter of our faith. Uh, there's a great little book of, of Thomas Watson quotes. Puritan Gems, the wise and holy sayings of Thomas Watson. Thomas Watson is the most vivid of all the, the, the Puritans, and he wrote a lot. So to save you a lot of reading, uh, someone did a fantastic job of compiling great quotes, and he shines when he points us to Christ. Uh, and I, want to, I just want to read these, uh, and we'll keep them in mind as we approach the table in a moment. Number one, he says, Jesus Christ the bread of life satisfies the soul. He satisfies the mind with confidence, the heart with affection, and the conscience with peace. That is true satisfaction. That's why I said, if you come to me, you will never hunger again. If you come to me, you will never thirst again. Secondly, uh, and if you didn't catch these, David, if you'll send them out during the week, please. Uh, number two, grace satisfies where other riches cannot. He who loves silver shall not be satisfied with silver. This is also vanity. And I love this picture. Riches can no more fill the heart than a triangle can fill a circle. If you need no better image, then riches can no longer fill a heart than a triangle can fill a circle. But grace fills up every chink. 
our hearts can be satisfied when we meditate and feast on the grace of God. That is our satisfaction because what was required for us has been satisfied. Thirdly, uh, there were so many, it was hard to narrow it down to three. Spiritual things satisfy. The more of heaven there is in the soul, the less earth will content. Spiritual things satisfy. The more of heaven there is in the soul, the less earth will content. Here's the encouragement about the Christian life and the Christian climb. Is the closer you get to the summit, the more time you have been hiking, the more time you've been walking with the Lord, the more time, the, the more that the earth offers no contentment. Like, I am getting closer to the summit. I can see the sun peeking through the horizon. The Lord has brought me so far. I'm not still rolling in the mud puddles that I did at the bottom of the mountain. We get closer and closer to that heavenly satisfaction. So in conclusion, this is why we look to Christ. This is why when we stop on that trail in the Christian life, stop and smell the roses. Stop and smell the beauty. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Gaze upon Christ. And so as we walk, going through the Christian life, when we see the rocks and the roots before us, and we're so worried we're going to trip and fall on our faces, he is the light to our path. And when we hike and we walk and we think we've really achieved something, we start to look back and look how far I've come, we remember that he climbed Golgotha first. That he carried his own cross. I'm just carrying my sorry butt up the hill. He carried his cross for my sins. He rose out of the tomb for my resurrection and new life. And he ascended into heaven so that I can join him. And so he has gone before us. And we walk in his path. We ascend up that hill because he has ascended. So that way, when we keep that in mind, we remember that Christ has given us his spirit to have the power to continue in this Christian walk. Christ is not only the source, but he's the comfort and the motivation for our climb. And we climb, we grow, we mature because of our standing with Christ and because our souls are at rest in him. Our sanctification comes out of our blessed satisfaction. I have peace because I am known by God. He chose me, he drew me, and he brought me into his house. And when he returns, he will show me that house. I want to close in John 14. We're familiar with John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But look at the context. John 14, chapter or verse, verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. What's the imagery here? In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. Let not your hearts be troubled. Our Savior has gone away. The King has left for a time. The bridegroom has left the invitees to the wedding waiting. But he is coming back, and the promise is that those who are mine, they will always be mine. And I'm going because there's something better ahead that I am preparing for you. And so Thomas is uh, our inner unsanctified man who uh, is working through things, which is so helpful for us. Because Thomas says what a lot of us are thinking, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So here's my final exhortation. If you are trying to find satisfaction anywhere else, you won't. You can't. There is no other way up that hill, but there is one way. There is one truth and there is one life. Nothing else will satisfy. 
You can fit that triangle in that circle as much as you want, but all of your hopes and dreams are just going to slide down the sides. But he says, come, come to me, come and feast. Come, buy without price, eat the bread of life. Come into my house because I have paid for your sins. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for the goodness of the gospel, the encouragement that we have in Christ. Lord, help us to climb when we need to and just to sit down and rest and meditate when we need to. Give us wisdom and discernment as we walk the Christian life. Surround us with brothers and sisters who will encourage us and point us to Christ. Remember, excuse me, remind us that we would remember and not forget your grace is enough. And it's not just enough. It is grace upon grace upon grace upon grace, overflowing with grace. Lord, comfort us that we are satisfied in Christ. We cannot fit one more thing in and we need to stop trying because Christ has done it all. We follow because he has gone before. We climb the hill because he climbed the hill before us. We can rest in the house because he has made us his house and he is preparing that house for us where faith will become sight and we will dwell with him forever. And it's in his great name we pray. Amen.